Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless you tonight. God, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you that you are a holy God. Father, we thank you that you're a mighty God, that you're a strong God. And Father, we thank you that, Lord, it is your good pleasure to cause us to uh, discover you, to cause us to learn of you. And Father, we thank you tonight that as we look to the scriptures, as we look to these foundational principles of the faith, which you have called us to uh, to learn and to know and to be able to move on, to, to grow in maturity, to build upon these things. Father, we pray tonight that you would open up the eyes of our understanding. Lord, may revelation take place. So it be more than head knowledge, but may your spirit breathe on it and may it click. And Father, may this truth dispel every lie, dispel everything that has been a uh, uh, twisting truth or has been a half truth. We thank you that tonight when we hear the truth of the word of the Lord, that our hearts burn within us, that our spirits come alive, and that, Father, we're able to go on to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all got your Bibles? Let's grab our Bibles, and we're going to run to the book of Hebrews. Praise the Lord again to all of y'all that are here joining us tonight for session number seven. We're going to be talking about the resurrection of the dead. And again, how fitting it is that the Lord would see fit for us to have this session right after Resurrection Sunday. Uh, really, the God's timing is perfect. So shout out to all of you and let's grab our Bibles. We're going to run to Hebrews 6, verse 1 through 2. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2 says this, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit. So, hallelujah. As we jump in tonight to the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, we have come to one of my favorite parts of the foundational principles. Uh, and I say it's one of my favorite parts because it both gives us great uh, hope and inspires and encourages us and gives us a sense of peace as we look towards the future. The doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, when you really understand what the scripture says and what he has given to us, it really does set your heart at ease. It also stirs your excitement. It stirs your hope. It stirs your joy as you look towards all that is to come. Uh, in uh, studying, and let me side note this here, because some of you that are on the live session right now, some of you are also in my Wednesday night class at Hope City House of Prayer. For all of you that are in my Wednesday night class, tonight's class is actually going to look pretty different than Wednesday night's class, because from, from Wednesday to today, uh, I've been digging through this stuff, and the Lord took me, I don't want to say a whole nother direction, but something along those lines, and really pulled this out for me in a whole new way, even from the last few times that I have taught it. Uh, but in my studies, I've come across this message preached by the late great Charles Spurgeon. If you know, uh, if you've ever heard of uh, Charles Spurgeon, you know they call him the Prince of Preachers. But there's a message that he preached back in 1856 on the resurrection of the dead. So the message is 167 years old, this, this sermon that he preached on the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and as of today, it really blows my mind, like, like listening to that message, uh, which I'm going to send you all in your email tonight, a link to that message. There's two links that I'm going to send you. There's going to be a link to the written out sermons for, for those of you that like to uh, read. You can do that. And there'll also be a link to the YouTube, which is an audio version of that message. All right. But this message is 167 years old. And it is so relevant for today. It sounds as if he was really just talking about the church today. It is so powerful. It'll really blow your mind. So I'm going to send you that link. Uh, but I'm going to reference that message a few times uh, throughout our study tonight. So just uh, so you know, I'm going to quote a few things. A number of the things that I quote from Charles Spurgeon are from that message. So please, please, please do yourself a favor. Uh, and when you get those links, take the time to go and to either read it or to listen to it. All right. Um, let's see where we're at. So the resurrection is core to our faith. It is vital to our belief in not only what it is to uh, come to faith, but in appropriating what is available to us even now. The resurrection 
When we speak of the resurrection of the dead, many immediately think of eternity and of the immortal soul. There's ideas of uh, living again and what will exist in the hereafter. But when we speak of the resurrection of the dead, we're not talking about the immortality of the soul, but rather we are talking about the body. We're talking about the body. We just celebrated uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ yesterday. And that celebration of the resurrection, as we dive in this into this tonight, we're going to touch on the resurrection of Jesus for sure. But when we talk about the foundation of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, we're not just talking about uh, the fact that Jesus got up, but what we're talking about is that his resurrection allows for our resurrection, that there is coming a day or a resurrection of the dead where your physical body will get up, all right? Charles Spurgeon said it this way, the doctrine is that this actual body in which I now exist is to live with my soul. That not only is this the vital spark of heavenly flame, as he said, uh, let me see where I'm at, uh, vital spark of heavenly flame to burn in heaven, but the very sensor in which the incense of my life does smoke is holy unto the Lord and is to be preserved forever. It is to say that the fullness of our being Spirit, soul, and body are intended by God to last forever, and our physical body, though currently corruptible, will one day be raised again. Are y'all with me tonight? Make sure y'all really focus in tonight. Gather your heart, gather your mind, gather your attention, uh, close out all the distractions, and let's listen in. There is going to be a physical resurrection of the body for the born-again believer. God created us, spirit, soul, and body, and he, his intention is that we live forever in this expression. Uh, let me see where I'm at. So Charles Spurgeon again said that not only is the vital spark of, of heavenly flame to burn in heaven, but the very censer in which the incense of my life does smoke is holy unto the Lord and is to be preserved forever. It is to say that the fullness of our being, spirit, soul, and body are intended by God to last forever, and our physical body, though currently corruptible, will one day be raised again. We will see if uh, in a few moments uh, that that question is, what am I saying? We will see if a few moments that the question is not, will our bodies be raised again? Uh, because they all will, but rather what will happen to our bodies after they are raised again? So the question we're asking tonight is not if our physical bodies will be raised. We'll see here in a few moments as we go through the scriptures how that is clear. It is clear that there will be a physical resurrection of our bodies. The question is not, will your body be raised? The question is going to be for you tonight that by the end of this, all of us will have to answer is what is going to happen to my body once it is raised, all right? The Greek word here for resurrection as used in, in Hebrews 6 is anastasis, An anastasis, anastasis, all right? I'm going to spell it out for you, for the note takers in the room. Here is the word anastasis. It's the Greek word for resurrection. It's spelled A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-S. A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S -S. And it means literally stand up or stand up again, referring to physical resurrection of the body. It means to stand up, to stand up again, or to have stand up power. Anastasis, all right? Anastasis. A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S. It is the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. It's the same word that is used in John 11 when Jesus is talking to Martha about her dead brother Lazarus. And he says, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. This Jesus is saying to her, right? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Thank you uh, to those of you putting it in the chat, the Greek word anastasis and the definition there. I appreciate that. So Jesus in, he, in John 11 again is here. He's talking to Martha and he says, I am the resurrection. I am the stand up power. I am, hallelujah, the ability to get up again. I am the resurrection. I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And in verse 25, he says that, John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus was declaring 
that through him, we have been given access to stand up power. Though we die, sleep the sleep of death, pass from this world, we will get up again. At the time of this chapter in, in the book of Hebrews, when it's being written, there were many people that were dying for their faith and their and as they were following Jesus. They were in many ways truly fulfilling uh, what the scripture talks about as being a witness. We talked about this in our prior sessions uh, on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and this message of the resurrection was vital for them. So at the time that this is written to the, the saints in the book of Hebrews, there were a number of people who were being uh, killed for their faith, and they were literally being that martyr or that witness, which is what the scripture says that we've received the Holy Ghost to be. And so it was really, really vital. This whole concept of the resurrection of the dead was vital for them to know, vital for them to understand. Y'all with me tonight? I'm going to take just one second just to check, check on the room. Y'all say amen in the comments. I want to know you're here, that you're tapped in, that you're listening. All right. Let me see them Amen. just for a minute. I see you. All right. Amen. 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 All right. Just want to know you're with me tonight. <clears throat> as we run through this, there's a whole lot to get through tonight. So I really am um, going to ask as many of you can to help us in the comments to stay on it. All right. Uh, perfectly, we'll get through all the notes. And if we don't, I'll definitely, definitely send these to you. All right. Death is a, ch a challenging concept. All of us who have experienced death, have experienced the death of, of loved ones, friends, family, uh, then you all know death can be a very, very challenging concept. There is a normal grief that comes with seeing your loved ones, friends, and family die, right? A sorrow that fills the heart and pains our soul. All of that is very normal. It's experienced by all in some form or another. So it's normal when we lose people, when we, when we experience death or encounter death, that we experience uh, forms of grief and sadness. That is very normal. I think it's very frustrating uh, as Christians when we try to kind of rush past that or act as if that's not okay or that people aren't allowed to cry. You know, sometimes in the Christian world, we are very uncomfortable with very normal emotions that God gave us. Uh, but we have to know that it is okay and it is normal and appropriate. We'll get to it in a little bit to have forms of grief and even forms of sadness when we experience death and loss, all right? That is normal. Uh, but, for uh, but for many people, there is frequently a hopelessness that seems to overcome them, death having much more a sense of finality and with any, without any hope of a future or the thought of that future is so off in the cloud somewhere that it's completely de detached from our realities. There are people who experience uh, sadness, experience grief, and it goes beyond that which is normal. It almost becomes debilitating because they don't have any sense of what is to come. There's not a, a, a surety or a knowing. For the believer, this should not be so. Though we will grieve loss and for sure shed tears, there is a reason why the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we do not grieve or sorrow as those who have no hope, because we do have a hope. That's what I want to get to tonight. We do have a hope. We have a hope and a future. We know that death is not the end, but really it is just the beginning. It is uh, just a transition into the fuller plan and purposes of God. And the fact is that the truly fulfilled life of the believer hasn't even reached its peak until that time that we pass from this life into the next. I hope y'all are getting this. There is for us an expectation and a hope of a resurrection. Essentially, what I'm saying is, for the especially in the 21st century church, you know, in 2023, uh, uh, there is this extreme focus on this life, right? And I get it. Maybe, you know, the church of old uh, or the people who have led the way in times past, maybe there was like this overemphasis on the future. Like the scripture says, so heavenly minded that you're, of, you're no earthly good. But we as a people have a tendency to go to extremes. We love to dwell in the extremes. So either we're always talking about eternity always focused on eternity, and we have no focus on the right now. We don't know what it is to be a human. We don't know what it is to go through day-to-day -day life. We don't have practicalities. We are very impractical, and we're very in the clouds, right? Or we go to the other extreme, 
where all we talk about is this life. All we talk about is this world. All we talk about is your purpose now. All we talk about is this uh, carnal, uh, temporal, temporary stuff. Do y'all know that the scripture says that your life is but a vapor? The old saints uh, had a focus in this way that they used to keep eternity ever before us, where they would uh, emphasize this idea that you are just a sojourner passing through. You're just a pilgrim passing through. It's not intended for this to be your final stop. And we act as if uh, uh, that God's purpose or intention for our life is to live, hallelujah, to get a good job, you know, to build up a nice little legacy and to die and to be able to say, you know, oh, we had this great life as if this life is somehow going to be memorial memorialized in the, in the next and that this is really all we're living for. That's not the case. We are just passing through. This life that we are living in in time, right, is, is so temporal. It's very temporary and it's but a vapor. It's a very, very small thing in light of eternity. Do y'all know that in eternity, there is no such thing as time? We're not going to be up there like, oh, you know, I've been with Jesus for six years, been in heaven for the last 20 years. There is no time. Eternity is not held within the restraints or within the confines of time. Now, I know that's hard for our human brain to understand, but you've got to get this, that there is coming a day where you, your life will no longer be restricted to time. And the truth is that when we pass from this life into the next, that's really when uh, our life really begins. That's when the fullness of God's plan really get started. Are y'all with me? Uh, so we have a whole lot to look forward to. We have a whole lot to prepare for. And if we keep living, only focus on this life, we won't know what to do when we get to the next. We have to prepare ourselves now. And we have access through the power of the resurrection, which we'll get to in just a minute, to appropriate the truth of eternity, to appropriate the truth of the life that we have been brought into right now. The fact is that we're not waiting to die. We're not waiting for Jesus to come and get us before we're able to live kingdom life. No, he said the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is right now. The, the power of God is right now. Eternity with Jesus is right now. The possibilities of all that God intended, purposes and plan for our life, we're not waiting to one day actualize. They're meant to be actualized right now while we are in this process of salvation called sanctification, but we, we do that while also realizing, holding the tension of these two truths, we won't ever fully actualize it until we pass from this life into the age to come, when we receive our glorified bodies, when we receive our resurrected bodies, that's when we'll have the fullness of it actualized, but we are able to appropriate truth and actualize the promises of God for our lives right now. Are y'all with me? All right, let's, let's, uh, let me see. I said that, let me try and look at my notes real quick. Uh, we do have a hope. We know that death is not the end. It is just the beginning. It's the transition into the fuller plan and purposes of God. The fact is that the truly fulfilled life of the believer hasn't even reached its peak until that time that we pass from this life into the next. There is for us, for the born again believer, an expectation and a hope of a resurrection. So let's look at this expectation of, the, of a resurrection because the concept of the resurrection of the dead didn't just begin with Jesus. It, it, the concept of that existed even in the Old Testament, right? Uh, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Again, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, all right? So it's, the, it's this whole plan of God that he has outlined for us. Let's look at Job chapter 19, Job chapter 19, and let's look at verse 25. We're going to read Job 19, 25 to 27, okay? Job 19, 25 to 27 for the note takers in the room. Job 19, Verse 25 to 27 says this, for I know that my redeemer lives. He shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I shall see God. 
whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Do y'all hear this? Listen, listen to what Job is saying. Listen to how the scripture reads. Job is saying, I know my Redeemer lives, and I know that he's coming. I know that he's coming again. He's going to stand on the earth, and I know that after my skin has been destroyed, he's talking about after I've slept the sleep of death. He's saying, after my body has been destroyed, I know that in my flesh, I will see him. I will see him. He says here, listen to the passion, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes will behold him and not another. My heart yearns within me. Not only did he have an expectation of the resurrection, but an excitement. Job, who lived probably a thousand years before Christ ever came, here he is with a revelation of the resurrection. He knew that in the end, far after his physical body was destroyed, that his Redeemer would stand on the earth and Job would behold him with his own eyes. He clearly had an expectation to live again in his physical body. See, not only that he believed this, but that his understanding of a coming resurrection to live in the sight of the Redeemer thrilled Job's heart. Do y'all see that? He said that there was a longing, there was a yearning in his heart for it. That is what's going, that is what going on to maturity looks like. It is uh, these foundational principles uh, being laid and then our life is built upon it, but it is literally this, it is us yearning and longing to be clothed from on high so that we can live in his sight. That's what going on to maturity looks like. That's, that's some imagery for you. This hunger, this seek for God built on these solid foundations allows us to step into what the previous chapters of Hebrews was talking about. This is priestly ministry after the order of Melchizedek and moving from a place of me and my to he and his. It is literally what ships us into being able to truly live out the purposes of God in the earth now. And to be able to see the manifestation of bringing heaven to earth in our day-to-day -day lives, in our families, and in our communities. We see this in the, in the even in the Lord's Prayer when he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How do, we, how do we speed up that day? How do we get to that? How do we cause that to happen? How do we appropriate the truth of what is to come, the truth of the age to come, the promises of the age to come? How do we get that now? That comes through priestly ministry. That comes from being able to move beyond, I'm just believing God for my light bill, or I'm just believing God for my rent, and being able to get to a place as sons and daughters where we're able to say like David, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that is what I'm going to seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold his beauty and to inquire in his temple. Are y'all with me? This is that growing up. This is that maturing. And this is the plan of God. And as we understand this doctrine of the resurrection, it should really stir your heart. It should stir your spirit and cause something to come alive in you so that you stop viewing resurrection as just something off in a distant or even just, you know, Jesus. And for many of you, you see resurrection as Easter and, you know, uh, uh, Easter bunny and eggs. Okay, <laughs> let's look at Isaiah chapter 28, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 19. It says this, the book of Isaiah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 28, I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. Isaiah 28, verse 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they will arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For the dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out its dead. Y'all see the text? This is in the book of Isaiah, speaking of resurrection. Isaiah had this revelation of the resurrection. He saw and wrote about the dead rising, their bodies living again. And he gives great imagery here of the art, uh, uh, literally, of the earth literally giving birth or casting out the dead. He says that they will wake up and they will shout, for joy. 
Notice that this promise of a joy-filled hope was specifically for those who belong to God. When he said, you're dead, this is a resurrection. Of, there is a resurrection for the wicked as well, but it's not unto life. So they don't shout for joy. We're, we're going to get to that in a minute. So I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. There is a resurrection for both the, the uh, saved and the unsaved. Both of us are getting about the grave. This is why I asked the question earlier. It's not a matter of, Will we be resurrected? Because we will. It's a question of what will happen to our bodies after we rise. Are y'all with me? All right. So uh, let's look here. Jesus taught and promised resurrection. So let's look at that. Jesus taught and he promised resurrection. Let's look at John 5, 28 to 29. John chapter number 5, 28 to 29. Y'all go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. If you have, I used to say this a lot. I'm going to start saying this some more. Get you a paper Bible. <laughs> Get you a paper Bible so you can touch the pages. John 5, 28 to 29. He says this. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Hear the scripture, y'all. And shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Y'all see that? Let's look at John 6, John 6, 39 to 40. John chapter number 6, 39 to 40. It says this, and this is the Father's will, which hath, which has sent me, that of all which he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus spoke frequently about the coming resurrection and spoke of a specific last day when this would all culminate. He told us that if we looked to him and believed on him, that we could be assured that we would be raised up again to life. There is coming a life, hallelujah, that is more uh, uh, real than the life that you're living right now, more full than the life that you're living right now. We are promised eternal life with him. And I can't even begin to explain, y'all really got to read your Bible, how amazing that day will be. Hallelujah. And truly, none of us even know how amazing it is because we only have a little bit of characteristics and descriptions about it. There's entire mysteries that we don't even know yet. The scripture says that when we get into eternity, when we get into the new Jerusalem, when we get into that day, he's going to sit us down and we're going to all realize that everything we know about him is just a drop in the bucket and he's going to teach us all things and we're all literally going to sit there with our mouths open wide in awe of all that there is to know and i believe greatly that many of us will look around at our brothers and sisters in christ and have to apologize for arguing and uh, bickering and all of this stuff that we do about stuff that that doesn't even make any sense we're all going to look in that day and realize that what we thought was just it was not that there was so much more to know hallelujah because there is so much more to know all right so jesus taught it jesus proclaimed it jesus promised it we looked at two examples there but there are there are a ton more uh that you can look at the apostles proclaimed the resurrection it was core and foundational to their preaching, the resurrection of the dead. They didn't just walk around preaching, come to Jesus, have a better life, come to Jesus. God just loves you so much. You know, oh, you know, you don't want to be lonely. Come to Jesus. Come. No, they preach the death. They preach the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And they spoke of the coming resurrection. They spoke of this doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. From Charles Spurgeon's sermon I referenced earlier, he says it this way, I find that they stood up in, my, in any place and declared from the fullness of their heart what they knew of Jesus Christ. But the main difference I observed was in the subjects of their preaching. So Charles Spurgeon in this sermon that, I, that uh, you all are going to watch, 
uh, he's basically saying, like, I was studying how the apostles preached, and I'm noticing a big difference between how they preached and what they preached in comparison to the preachers of today. Now, mind you, again, this sermon was 167 years ago, but really, I mean, really, he's speaking as if it was today. He says, I observed, the difference I observed was in the subjects of their preaching. Surprise, surprised I was when I discovered that the very staple of the preaching of the apostles was the resurrection of the dead. I found myself to have been preaching the doctrine of, of the grace of God, to have been upholding free election, to have been leading the people of God as well as I was enabled to into the deep things of his word, but I was surprised to find that I had not been copying the apostolic fashion half as nearly as I might have done. The apostles, when they preached, always testified concerning the resurrection of Jesus and the consequent resurrection of the dead. It appears that the Alpha and the Omega of their gospel was the testimony that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. The apostles, uh, in like manner as Jesus, proclaimed the resurrection of the dead over and over and over again. Let's look at the book of Acts, chapter number four, verse one through two. Acts four. One through two. Hope y'all still with me tonight. Shout out to the comment the comment writers holding down note taking. I appreciate y'all. Acts four, verse one through two. It says this. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they're preaching the resurrection of the dead, and it's upsetting some people. All right. Let's look at Acts chapter 23, verse 26. We know that they preached the resurrection of the dead because it says here specific, specifically that this part of, of the preaching upset people. It got people bothered. All right, Acts 23, verse 6. Acts 23, verse 6. It says this. But when Paul perceived that one that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. So we know here in Acts 23 that he was preaching what? A hope and a resurrection of the dead. Acts 24, 15. Let's look there. Acts 24 and verse 15. Hallelujah. Acts 24 and verse 15. It says this, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, that there will be a resurrection of the dead of both the just and the unjust. That's Acts 24 verse 15. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 23. It says this, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful. But now Christ is risen of the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruit, 
afterward those who are Christ at his coming. He was saying, he was saying there is a resurrection. And if you don't believe in, the, in not just the resurrection of Jesus, if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, of all of those of us who are his, if you don't believe that that physical body, not, and we'll get into this in a minute, but not, that, not just that you're going to be like a spirit floating through the air. That's not what he's teaching because the Greeks believed in that. The, 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 uh, all kinds of heathens believed in that concept that their soul or their spirit would just float through the air. That's not what he's teaching here. He is teaching to us a promise of life to our spirit, soul, and our body that because Jesus rose, that means that all that are his are rising. And if Jesus, if, if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, then Jesus didn't rise. And if that's the case, then your preaching is in vain. But he did rise. Hallelujah. And because he rose, we will rise too. Hallelujah. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse 16 to 18. 1 Thessalonians, if you don't know how to spell it, put T-H-E-S-S. -S. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. It says this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. They preached it. They proclaimed it. They taught it. They defended it. And as they went forth, there was a great grace that was upon them all. Acts chapter 4, verse 33, says that as they did this, there was a great grace upon them all to accomplish the work of God as they declared the resurrection from the dead. Are y'all with me? I'm going to read you this quote from, from Spurgeon. All right. It says this, the doctrine is that this actual body in which I now exist is to live with my soul, that not only as the vital spark of heavenly flame to burn in heaven, but the very censer in which the incense of my life does smoke is holy unto the Lord and is to be preserved forever. The spirit Everyone, uh, the spirit everyone confesses is eternal, but how many there are who deny that the bodies of men will actually start up or get up from their graves at that great day? Many of you believe that you will have a body in heaven, but you think it will be an airy, fantastic body instead of believing that it will be a body like to this, flesh and blood, although not the same kind of flesh, for all flesh is not the same flesh. A solid, substantial body, even such as we have here. And there are yet fewer of you who believe that the wicked will have bodies in hell. For it is gaining ground everywhere that there are to be no positive torments for the damned in hell to affect their bodies, but that it is to be a metaphorical fire, a metaphorical brimstone, a metaphorical chains, a metaphorical torture. But if you, were, if you were Christians as you profess, hear the words of Spurgeon. He says, if you were Christians as you profess, you would believe that every mortal man who ever existed shall not only live by the immortality of his soul, but his body shall live again. That the very flesh in which he now walks the earth is as eternal as the soul and shall exist forever. That is the peculiar doctrine of Christianity. The heathens never guessed or imagined such a thing. And consequently, when Paul spoke of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, which proves that they understood him to speak of the resurrection of the body. For they would not have mocked had he only spoken of the immortality of the soul. That having been already proclaimed, it was already proclaimed by Plato and by Socrates and received with reverence. They already believed it, is what he's saying. People already believed that there was the immortality of the soul. Many people believed that. What they mocked was the preaching of the resurrection of the dead. Are y'all with me? So let's look at this. Uh, let me see where I'm at. Mm, okay. Good, good, good. We, got, we still got a lot to get through. So I'm going to back up here. One of the things I want you to see specifically is what we read the scriptures about how the Sadducees came and all of this. The Sadducees didn't believe in 
a resurrection of the body. They didn't believe in uh, angels, spirits, none of that. So there was, you see that defending, you see that proclamation, you see all of that, that there is a resurrection of the physical body, all right? So let's talk about what is the agent of the resurrection. When I say agent, I mean the thing that produces it or is capable of producing such an effect, right? An active or efficient cause, a means or instrument by which a guiding intelligence achieves a result. We see from the scriptures that the agent of the resurrection, according to Jesus, is the power of God. When Jesus was speaking to the Sadducees uh, and they were trying to trip him up. So in Mark chapter 12, we see the Sadducees are coming and they're really trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to like get him to say something where they can be like, ah, gotcha. Right. So Mark chapter 12, you see the Sadducees come. They're trying to trip him up. Uh, and his response or his rebuke to them was that they did not know the scriptures or the power of God. Y'all got to see Mark chapter 12. They're trying to trip up Jesus. They're asking him all kinds of crazy questions. He, they basically ask him, like, if a man uh, uh, has a wife, uh, the, the husband dies, and then, you know, he has siblings, the wife remarries all according to custom. Let's say she remarried seven times to, to all these, you know, uh, uh, kinfolk. Uh, and yet there was no seed produced and on and on and on. And it says, you know, in the resurrection, whose wife is she? Right. They're trying to, like, catch him here with this really kind of outlandish question. He rebukes them before he even answers the question. He rebukes them and he says, you don't know the scripture or the power of God, because if they knew it, they would believe in the resurrection because it is by the power of God. Right. He said in, in, in eternity or in the resurrection, there is no marriage or giving in marriage. So you're being foolish, even trying to ask this question, because you don't even understand what God is trying to do by giving us the resurrection. Right. The Apostle Paul affirms this truth in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 14. He says, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by what? By what? By his power. There is coming a resurrection of the dead, and it is by the power of God. While it may be difficult or challenging for some of us to understand how this is possible, we must know that according to Luke chapter 1, verse 37, that with God, all things are possible, and that it is by the power of God, the resurrection is accomplished. All right, y'all still with me tonight? Let me know in the comments, you're still here. All right, let's look at two specific resurrections. So I wanna talk to you about two specific resurrections real quick, we mentioned them earlier, but let's look at Acts chapter 24 and verse 15. I think we quoted this earlier. Acts 24, verse 15. It says this, I have hope in God. Uh, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. All right. There's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Let's look at John chapter 5, 28 to 29. We quoted this earlier. So these are just kind of bringing it back to your uh, mind. All right. John chapter 5, 28 to 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves, all, all of them, will hear his voice and will come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So there's going to be two resurrections. Understand that every single person will absolutely be raised again. We see from the scripture that some are getting up having a resurrection to life and others are getting up having a resurrection of damnation. You have heard it said that you only live once, right? You heard that saying, YOLO, you only live once. But this is not true. You will live twice. For some of you, you, you know, all of us are gonna live twice. So you don't only live once. That's why you should be living to live again, all right? You should be going through your day to day to live again because you don't YOLO. We don't YOLO. You're going to live twice. Every single person will live twice. OK, the problem is or the, the challenging or concerning thing is that for some, you will die twice. For some, you will die twice. That second death is not a doing away with your um body, but rather it's an eternity spent having uh, uh, that second death is not a doing away of your consciousness, but rather it is an eternity spent having all of your senses and feeling and body restored and fit 
for your destruction in the same manner that those who are raised to life will walk in that with a glorified body having been changed. So as a note here, all of us will live again. Every single person. You don't only live once. You will live twice. However, after you come to life again, you will be, for some, there is coming a second death. A second death. All right? So let's look at, no YOLO, just yo. <laughs> right. All right. Let's look at the first fruit of the resurrection. Let's talk about the first fruits of the resurrection. The entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 really deals with this concept of resurrection in a really full way. So I absolutely encourage all of you to take some time to dig through it and really let the truths of the text soak into your heart. All right. So that's 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter. I do want to look at a few pieces of it, though, while we're here. Uh, in the beginning of chapter 15, Paul spends a lot of time talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus, not because the believers in Corinth denied Jesus' resurrection, but rather they denied our resurrection. The believers in Corinth had been uh, uh, hanging out with Sadducees and having conversations uh, with people and it started to influence the way they thought and the way that they lived. So they believed in the resurrection of Jesus, but they began to not believe in the resurrection of us, all right? They believed we lived forever, just not in resurrected bodies. There were a number of schools of thought and philosophies that inspired this. The teachings of Greek philosophy, which taught that the spirit was pure and that there was uh, and therefore, a resurrecting of the body wouldn't be something to be desired, right? Or there was the teaching of the Sadducees that any idea of a world beyond this was just wishful thinking. So Paul takes time here in 1 Corinthians 15 to show how not only was Christ risen, but goes on to explain that if they are going to believe that the dead will not be raised, then they must equate that to mean that Christ didn't raise either, which makes their believing in him or their faith in vain. He goes on to teach that Jesus did indeed rise, and because he rose, we will rise also. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. 1 Corinthians, I hope this is blessing you tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. It says this, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Jesus' resurrection from the dead makes our resurrection possible. He became the first fruits for us so that in him we can all be made alive. The Enduring Word commentary says that uh, first fruits is the ancient Greek word apar aparche, aparche. I don't know if that's how you actually pronounce it, but it's A P A R C H E. A P A R C H E. This is the Greek word for first fruits, all right? In the Septuagint, this word is used for the offering of first fruits, and in secular usage, y'all got to hear this. Jesus was the first fruits. We just saw that in 1 Corinthians 15, right? We know that he was the first fruits by his res death and resurrection. Uh, this word uh, for first fruits in the Septuagint is used for the offering of the first fruits, and in secular usage, the word was used for an entrance fee. <laughs> I wish y'all got this. Jesus, literally the word means entrance fee. Jesus was the entry fee. His death and resurrection got us into the resurrection and the life. You literally have the ability to declare, I'm with him. I'm with him. Like if, if you've ever had to go somewhere where you had to pay an entry fee at the door and there's people that get in for free, at, right? And they're like, oh, I'm with him. I'm with him. We have the ability to say that about Jesus when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to the resurrection of the dead, when it comes to entering into all that God has purposed and planned for us. By, the, by definition that he is the first fruit, we're able to say, I'm with him. Now, the devil make an accusation. You can't afford it. You're not worthy of it. You're not good enough. You didn't pray enough. You ain't fast enough. No. Yeah. Thank you, Shante. I got VIP entry. I'm with him. He's my entry fee. He paid the price. He's the first fruits. And because he's the first fruits, I got expectation. 
You got to let me in. Are you with me? Hallelujah. So we literally have uh, that ability to declare that. Romans 6, <laughs> chapter number 5 says, hallelujah. Says Michelle, yes, he's the door. All right. Not only is he the door, but he's the entry fee. Woo! I'm done. Take an offering. My God. Not only is he the door, hallelujah, but he is the entry fee. Jesus. Romans 6, chapter 5 says this. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a hope and a future. To hope is to have a confident expectation, and we are positioned in anticipation by his resurrection in the same way that the Jews were assured of God's blessing on the whole harvest because of the first fruits they offered to God. There is a confident expectation. I want y'all to know this. That word hope literally translated means a confident expectation that something good is going to happen. I have a hope. I have a future. And I'm assured of that because Jesus got up from the dead, because he is my first fruits, because he paid for my VIP entry. I'm confident I have an expectation. And I believe though we say this in theory, we have a head knowledge of it. A lot of us do, but we don't have revelation. We need a revelation that the Holy Spirit would blow on this truth and that it would literally um, come alive in us, just like when Jesus was walking along the road after his resurrection with the disciples who didn't even know that it was him. And he began to teach out of the word of God. And, and it says, did not our hearts burn within us? We need a revelation that this truth burns in our hearts, burns in our spirits, that because Jesus is the first fruit, I have a hope and a future, a confident expectation. Not that, oh, I'm just going to kind of make it up to the pearly gates. No, I'm not just trying to get to heaven. I'm trying to get to where Jesus is because his presence is heaven to me and where he is, is heaven to me. And the scripture doesn't say that we're just going to float off in the sky to live somewhere up in the clouds. But it tells us that there's literally coming an age, the age to come, when the new Jerusalem will descend out of the cloud, will connect with earthly Jerusalem, and that we will all flow through that city. In the age to come, there is a world way beyond what you can imagine. I am confident. I have an expectation that not only will I see in theory, but I will literally live. I will live in the place, hallelujah, where there is no sun and there is no moon because though they are bright, there is a brightness that shines brighter than they can ever shine. And he sits on the throne. It lights the city. There are streets that are paved with gold. Uh, 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 they tell us that that gold that, that it speaks about in the scripture is a gold unlike any gold that you have ever seen in this world. Hear me. The scripture talks about streets paved with gold. Do you know that there is a gold that is so pure that it is see-through? You ain't never seen it. Hallelujah. The scripture says that before the throne of God, there was a sea uh, uh, of crystal, like under glass, right? There's, there was a sea before the throne, that there are creatures, that there is wheels in the middle of wheels, angels who have wings all over their body, in their wings, all kinds of fascinating stuff. That's not a, a hyperbole. That's not a... a can, uh, a comparison for you to help give you some kind of imagery. No, this is real stuff happening right now as we speak in the third heaven, and we are going to experience that for all of eternity, and we have a hope and a future, not that we'll be able to see it one time but that God will raise our bodies up from the grave and they will get up changed and different and new and that we will be able to behold him as he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Let me calm down here a little bit. Let's talk about, whew, let's talk about the bodies of the resurrected. Let's talk about the physical bodies. So we're talking about there's a, a physical resurrection that your body is going to get up from the grave. I don't care if they buried it, put it in a tomb, burnt it up, and then you spread the ashes across the sea. 
when he calls for us and when you hear his voice, every atom of being will begin to assemble and every single body will be raised, all right? Now, here's what you got to know. When our bodies are raised, what then of our bodies? What are our bodies going to be like? Can we talk about that for a little bit? What are the bodies going to be like? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. We're still in 1 Corinthians 15. 35 to 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 49. I hope this is blessing you tonight. It says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 49. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of animals, another of fish and of an, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So this is where some people get that concept uh, that he's alluding here, that in glory or in eternity, there are varying levels of glory. So also is the resurrection of the body. The body is sown in corruption. Y'all got to hear the word of God. <laughs> Listen with spiritual ears. Listen closely. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. It is sown as a natural body, but it's going to be raised as a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is of the Lord from heaven, as was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust and is the heavenly man. So also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born, and as we have been born, the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Here is one of the mysteries that I love. The bodies of the resurrected, Paul teaches here a lesson on sowing and reaping that has everything to do with ingraining in us an understanding of death. For the righteous, so that we grasp the truth and the promise of what is to come. He says in verse 36 to 38 that the things that you sow are not made alive unless they first die. And when they go down into the dirt, they cease to be what they are, but rather there is a change that takes place and they come bursting up out of the ground again. He says that God gives each body as he pleases and that for every seed that is sown, there is a certain body that will be raised. You don't plant an apple seed and expect to get a bigger apple seed. Are y'all with me? You don't put an apple seed in the ground and think, I'm just going to wait a little while and then I'm going to dig up a, a, a bigger apple seed, okay? You expect to get a plant that will produce apples. And that obviously, it's going to look much different coming out of the ground than it did going in. We are not sitting in expectation that the same body that went in the ground or even, or, uh, we're not waiting for or expecting the same exact body nor are we even expecting an improved version of our body, but rather a glorious body that is given to us as God pleases for each one of us to possess. Hear me. When you bury the body of a believer, you are sowing a seed that will be raised up again. That understanding of that sowing is so precious, not only for how we view our own future, but the future of those whom we love, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen to the way that Spurgeon puts it. This is the way Charles Spurgeon puts it. Dear friends, if such be death, if it be but a sowing, 
Let us have done with all faithless hope. Let us have done with all faithless, hopeless, graceless sorrow. Our family circle has been broken, say you. Yes, but only broken that it may be reformed. You have lost a dear friend, yes, but only lost that friend that you may find him again and find more than you lost. They are not lost, they are sown. My God. I'm going to read this last sentence to you again from Charles Spurgeon, speaking of the death of the believer, for the death of the believer. If you are a believer or you know someone who serves the Lord, you know that they know Jesus, here's what you got to know. There, yes, the family circle is broken, but it's only momentary. There will be a reforming of the family. There will be a re-knitting of the heart. But he says, though you lose them, they're not lost. They're sown. They are sown. What a concept. This truth gives understanding to the scripture we so frequently hear quoted at funerals and memorials that we do not grieve as those who have no hope. How frequently is this said, yet there is a longing in our hearts to respond. What does that mean? I have a hope in Jesus of eternal life. I hope there is a life beyond this, mansions, etc. But to just quote that scripture with no understanding that we actually have a hope in the future in the resurrection life to be raised to life again with Jesus uh, uh, that he paid our entry fee. He was our first fruits into the resurrection, which we will be raised into a body that is fit to dwell with him forever in the age to come. If we don't get that, then what is what hope is it that we're actually declaring? There is none. If we're just saying that to say it without the truth, that the hope we are declaring, then the hope that we are declaring is empty and it is void and it is unable to truly comfort us. This is why Paul said that we're to comfort one another with this truth of the resurrection because it's comforting. It is. Listen to how Paul describes the way that our bodies will be raised, the condition that we will find ourselves in, the hope that we have, not just for us, but for every brother and sister in Christ, every person we know who, who, who knows Jesus. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 45, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 45, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, raised it in corruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it's going to be raised in glory. Sown in weakness, but it's going to be raised in power. Sown in a natural body, raised in a spiritual body. Y'all see this? He's telling you that it's going to be sown one way, but when it bur bursts forth from the grave, when that body is raised again, it will not be the same. Hallelujah. I hope y'all get this. Went down with cancer. You're getting up healed. You may have gone down a body lamenting. You're not getting up the same way. You went in the ground, a body uh, uh, facing the limitations of age and, and disease and sickness. You went in facing the, the limitations of height and the limitations of the laws of this world, but that's not how you're coming out the grave. When you get up, when you are raised from the dead, you, because of his first fruit, that entry fee to the born again believer, when you get up from the dead, you will not be held to any limitation. You will not be held to any current issue. You're not going to have the same aches and limitations and inability to reach and inability to do. You're, you won't have any of that. You're getting up changed. You're raising different. Listen to what he says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 46 to 49. I hope this is blessing you, and I hope this is making sense. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46 to 49, 46 to 49. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth. He was made of dust. Speaking of Adam, the second man is the Lord from heaven and was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, right? Speaking of Jesus. From the beginning, since the fall of man, we have been born after the image of that first Adam, right? So though in our created state, we, let me explain it this way. You got to understand that there is a created state and then there is a born state. The way you were created is not the way you were born. This is why 
I don't argue with people when they say I was born this way. You're right. You were. You sure were. All of us were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Every single one of us. Now, I don't know what became of that. I don't know what your proclivities are, uh, have become, what your issues are. Your issues were not my issues and vice versa. Your, your born state, all of us were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. That's a fact. You were born that way. Every sin that you can name, you were born that way. All right. But the way you were born is not the way you were created. You were created way before you were ever born. Before you were born, you were already created in the mind of God. You existed in the mind of God before your mama ever met your daddy and there was a twinkle in the eye and you came about. You were created in the mind of God. And when he created you, he created you, hallelujah, uh, in his image and his likeness. And he created you a spirit, a soul, and a body. He created you in a way in which your spirit reigned as king. Your uh, soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, served the spirit, and your body came along for the ride. The, when the fall of man came, speaking of your born state or sinful state, in your born state, you are, your body reigns as king. Your soul serves the body, and your spirit doesn't come along for the ride. Your spirit is cut off. It is dead in sin, literally cut off from the life of God. But this is what happens through salvation, the plan of redemption. When we are born again, when we come to Jesus and he saves us and he births us out again, a new birth, <laughs> right? That new birth or that born again. This is why I tell people, it doesn't matter how you were born. You might have been born that way, but you are given the opportunity to be born again. What you don't realize is you're not being born again into a, 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 a new birth in the sense of like something that didn't exist before. Your new birth is actually a being born into your first intention, God's first intention for you. If I could put it to you this way, this is the best way I can put it to you. From the fall of man, your born state is made in the image of the likeness of Adam, that, that uh, fallen nature, if you will, okay? That's what I've talked about, that, that body reigning as king, the soul serving the body, and the spirit being dead in sin. Through salvation, through faith in Jesus Christ, through the shed blood of Jesus, coming into this invitation by the Lord to be born again, to bring us into new life, what he does is... He puts us back in right order or restores us or redeems us to our original state, okay? Now, if I could give you some imagery here, and if you're a photographer or you know anything about this kind of stuff, then this will make sense. But if I could put it to you this way, imagine a photographer taking a picture, right? When a photographer takes a picture in the raw, that's the photography terms, that picture is at its highest quality and its uh, highest resolution. That word resolution, basically when I say highest resolution, the original picture from the photographer, that original file, that it has its highest resolution built into it. And what that means is you can zoom in at the closest level. High resolution means the closer you get to, uh, to it, the more you zoom in, the, the level of clarity that there is at the closest levels. So in the original image, it has the highest resolution, which allows you to get as close as you can and still see, still make sense of all the details. When an image has low resolution or is low quality, what happens is, though you may comprehend what that picture is at a distance, the closer you get to it, the blurrier it becomes. The more you zoom in, it's harder to see what the details are because there's not enough clarity or enough resolution or enough quality. So to give you some imagery here, you being created in the image of God, which is how he created you, in, in, in 2023, the best imagery I can give you is God took a selfie, all right? And that's how you and I were made. We were made in the image of God, created in the image and the likeness of our creator. But because of the entrance of sin, when we were born, 
Hallelujah. When that picture was given, when that image was given, we put a filter. We had a filter put on that picture. Any photographer, any professional photographer, they, they have it in their terms and conditions nowadays, will tell you it's like when you take a professional image and you put it on Facebook or you put it on Instagram, but you put a filter on it. As soon as you put a filter on that image, immediately the resolution and the quality of that picture is extremely diminished extremely diminished. What that means is when you go to zoom in, there's no clarity, there's no details, you're not able to see exactly what it is at the closest level. That is the result of sin. The filter of sin and death and corruption has altered the original image that God created us to be. This is why there are identity crises even now is because we're not able to see the closer we get to ourselves what we really are. It's too blurry. It's too foggy. Therefore, people have a tendency to grasp for a purpose and identity and what they are. And what is wild is, is that people People who don't know who they are are constantly reaching out to other people who don't know who they are, trying to understand themselves, trying to grasp onto some kind of clarity or identity. And what you don't realize is, is that the more you do that, just like with a picture, just like with a digital image, the more you do that, the more you send it around, the more you go back and forth, put it here, put it there, put this filter on, put that filter on, put this effect on, put that effect on. What begins to happen is every single time you do that, the quality and the resolution diminishes more and more and more. To give you some, some other words, essentially, the blurrier and blurrier and blurrier that picture becomes until you're not even able to recognize the picture that is in front of you from its original image. They become two very different images, all right? But the plan of salvation, what Jesus does for us is by the resurrection of Jesus, he comes to restore us, to redeem us, to bring us back to our original resolution, to bring us back to our original state so that at the closest levels of who we are, at the deepest parts of who we are, we are able to once again say, I know who I am. I know who I'm created to be. I'm not idolizing purpose. I'm not running through life, reaching out for everything because I decided to go directly to the manufacturer, directly to the creator, directly to the one who created me because he's the only one that can actually show me who I am. He's the only one that has the original blueprint. He's the only one that has the original image. He's the only one that has the power to restore that image to what it was originally intended to look like. Are y'all with me? Hallelujah. His original purposes and plans. This is what the resurrection brings us into. This is what 1 Corinthians 15 means by we at one point, bore the image, currently bear that image of Adam, but in the resurrection, we'll be able to experience the fullness of the image of the heavenly man. But here's again, to the point of tonight, that hope in that future is not meant for you to wait until you die to experience that. You have the ability to put it off now. That's that process that we're in now. This uh, uh, process of sanctification is not just you becoming, but it's also you unbecoming. This is why the scripture says that for the born again believer, you have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Lord literally gives us the Holy Ghost, which is the teacher who comes alongside us. That word teach is translated from the original language. It means to draw out from within, which means this, to the born again believer, you don't got to reach out to Oprah and to Iyanla and to self-help and to all of this stuff to discover who you are. What you have to do is to reach within to the Holy Ghost where he will begin to teach you and lead you and guide you through his word into all truth so that you can discover exactly who you are and what God God's plan and purpose is for your life. I hope this is making sense. Jesus said it. G even Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, the God man, when he came down, fully God and fully man, as he began to start his earthly ministry, he made a declaration. He said, 
Lo, behold, I come in the volume of the book. I come in the volume of the book. I don't know if you can see this because of, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. What he said is, I found myself in the book. I found myself in the book and I cannot be moved. Stand steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord. We have the word of God. This is what the power of the resurrection does. The doctrine of the resurrection not only gives us a promise of a future and a hope, which should excite us and create yearning within our heart, but it also gives us access into the ability, hallelujah, to actualize that truth now, to appropriate that truth now, and to walk in that truth now in our day to day. You have Holy Ghost believer, born again believer, the ability to walk in the image of the heavenly man, to walk after the life of Christ and to allow yourself to be renewed, renewed in your heart, renewed in your mind, renewed in your spirit. You are not subject to the things of this world. Yes, you are having a human experience, but you are not, hallelujah, just a human being. You are a spiritual being. You are a spirit. You live in a body. You are a, a spirit. You live in a body and you possess a soul. So though you are having a human experience, you are a spiritual person. You live by the spirit. You live by the resurrection life. You live by the power of God. So we don't acquiesce to the ways of this world. We don't acquiesce into fear and anxiety and depression, though we may experience those things. And it's important for us to acknowledge that and understand that and have empathy for that. We are not that. I hope y'all got this. By the resurrection and the life, we are a spiritual being and we live as that redeemed individual, not of this world, but just passing through to get to our final home. I hope all of this is making sense tonight. Hallelujah. All right, let's look at Philippians 3. We're almost done. Philippians 3. Philippians chapter number 3. Verse 21, Philippians 3, 21, it says this, <clears throat> who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. There is a glorious body. To wrap this part up, it is safe to say that because we are raised as he is and because we will bear the image of Jesus in the fullness as it was originally intended, then the best example we can look at as to what that resurrected body will look like is his. We know that the resurrected body of Jesus was material and that he could eat. In, in according to Luke 24, 39 to 43, the scripture said that he was raised from the dead and that he continued with them, that he showed himself to many people. And the scripture said that he ate, said he ate some fish. Actually, Jesus ate, right? Spirits don't eat. <laughs> he had a physical body. You, the resurrected Christ, his resurrected body ate. It was material. He was also not bound by the laws of nature. He walked through walls. He went from one place to another, translated. He was not bound by natural laws. Understand that your physical body will not be limited to the things that it's limited to now. Your physical body in the resurrection will not be limited to space and time. Your physical body will not be limited to the laws of the universe and, 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 and what goes up must come down. You're not going to be limited. We see this with Jesus. And because his physical glorified body is what we have as an example for us, we know the same to be true. As we look at the bodies of the righteous who have been raised, if we are following the thought of Paul here, where he talks about seeds and every seed being given a body as God sees fit uh, to fit the context uh, it is in, right? The last scripture, sorry. The last scripture, you talking about what I was talking about, the body of Jesus, the, the laws of nature, that was Luke 24. 31 to 37. Luke 24, 31 to 37. Okay. All right. So, so every, just as we, in our earthly bodies, 
that we currently have, our, our earthly bodies are conducive for our current environment, okay? Our spiritual bodies are the bodies that we, re we receive in the resurrection are created and designed for the environment to come. For the righteous, we receive glorified bodies, but for the unrighteous, they are given bodies that are fit for destruction. A body that has the ability to feel and see and touch and endure pain and affliction, but these are bodies that are created for the damnation that they are to receive. Body created to suffer by the flame yet without burning up. So you got to understand in the same way our physical body now is created to be conducive for the, the environment that it is in, in the same way that we will receive as born again believers, a glorified body that is created for the context of the age to come or our life in eternity, uh, glorified, uh, incorruptible, you know, all of this, it's fit for, what, for what's to come. In the same way that those that are raised to damnation or those who are resurrected to death the scripture says that they will also be given a body. We're following the same thought here, that every seed is given a body as the Lord purposes. Let's look at Matthew chapter number five, verse 29 through, mm, hold on here. I put the, I put my notes in wrong. I put 29 to 10. So let me just confirm this real quick. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 29, or Matthew 5. 29, I believe it's 29 to 30. Mm, I don't know. It might be 20. Yeah, I think it's 29 to 30. So y'all tell me if that's correct, because I, I'm, I'm, I have it written up, but I have the address to it wrong. But it says this, and if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. So notice that the scripture here in Matthew 5 says that you'll have a body in hell. All right. It says not that your whole body should be cast into hell. And if your right hand offend you, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. All right, so that's Matthew 5, 29 to 30. Let's look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. We're, we're literally at the last couple of notes here, so I hope y'all can lock in just for a few more moments as we wrap up session seven, all right? Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. It says this, Fear not those who can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather... Fear him which is able to destroy both, both, which means you're going to have both <laughs> the soul and the body in hell. Hallelujah. Charles Spurgeon uh, says it this way. I'm going to read you a, a, a quote here from that message. He says, though your soul shall be punished, your bodies will be punished as well. You who are sensual and devilish do not care about your souls being punished because you never think about your souls. But if I tell you a bodily punishment, you will think of it far more. Christ may have said that the soul should be punished, but he far more frequently described the body in misery in order to impress his hearers. For he knew that they were sensual and devilish and that nothing that did not affect the body would not touch them in the least. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body according to that we have done, whether it be good or evil. But this is not the only text to prove the doctrine. I will give you a better one. Matthew uh, verse 29 says, if you're right, we just read this, offend me on and on, your, uh, not your whole soul, but your whole body. Man, this does not say that your soul shall be in hell. That is, uh, that is affirmed many times. We know that. But it positively declares that your body shall. That the same body which is now standing here in the aisle or sitting in the pew, if you die without Christ, shall burn forever in the flames of hell. It is not a fancy of man, but a truth that, that your actual flesh and blood and those very bones shall suffer. Try or your whole body shall be cast into hell. But, but lest that one proof should not suffice you, hear another out of the same gospel. Chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell will be the place for bodies as well as souls. 
As I have remarked, wherever Christ speaks of hell and of the lost state of the wicked, he always speaks of their bodies. You scarcely find him saying anything. <clears throat> you, you scarcely find him saying anything about their souls. He says, where the worm dies not, which is a figure of physical suffering, the worm torturing forever the inmost heart like a cancer within the very soul. He speaks of the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, do not begin telling me that this is a metaphorical fire. Who cares for that? If a man were to threaten to give it to give me a metaphorical blow on the head, I should care very little about it. He would be welcome to give me as many as he pleased. And what say and what say the wicked? We do not care about the metaphorical fires, but they are real, sir. Yes, as real as yourself. There is a real fire in hell, as truly as you have now a body, a fire exactly like that which we have on earth in everything except this it will not consume though it will torture you so your body will be prepared by god in such a way that it will burn in actual flame did our savior mean fictions when he said he would cast body and soul into hell what should there be a pit for if there were no bodies why fire why chains if there were to be no bodies can fire touch the soul? Can pits shut in spirits? Can chains fetter souls? No. Pits and fire and chains are for the bodies, and bodies shall be there. That's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. All right? All right, we're, we're wrapping up. This is the last uh, part here, okay? I said earlier, and I will recall to you, <clears throat> that when for the believer the resurrection unto life is what brings us into the original plan and purpose of God in the fullness. We are given our bodies that were created for the eternity that we are entering into. Understand that your new body, your resurrected body, is not a resurrected corpse, but rather it is a new way of life that will never die again, all right, for the born-again believer. Death is not only told to behave, it is defeated. Hear the triumphant declaration of Paul. Death is swallowed up in victory. Y'all put this in the chat tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57. It says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall we shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades or oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip, y'all. Are y'all with me? Death has lost its grip. The grave, hallelujah, loses its victory. When Jesus got up from the grave as that first fruits, he rose with all power in his hands, uh, having defeated death, hell, and the grave. For the believer, death is no longer something that we have need to fear or dread or worry about, but we get to join with Paul in saying, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? If you're not saved, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then yes, death will have much sting and the grave will have much victory, but you don't have to go that way. We have been given access into this liberty, into this freedom that by the blood of Jesus on the cross, his dying and his resurrection, the entry fee was paid and the door swings wide for all who will come to come to believe just uh, as you are, just as, hallelujah, that for all who will believe that we will never be the same again. Hallelujah. 
Death is a lie. We are, for those of us who believe, we have access into this freedom. I want to wrap this session up tonight as we prepare to be done. We're getting ready to get off here. So shout out to all of you that have stuck in with it tonight. I want to read to you these last two quotes from Spurgeon, uh, and I hope that they stir you as they did me. Okay, so I'm going to read you these last two quotes, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to be done for tonight. Okay, but here, here are the words of Spurgeon here. He says, for those who are not in Jesus Christ, death still has a sting. The sting of death lay in this, that we had sinned and were summoned to appear before God whom we had offended. This is the sting of death to you, unconverted ones. Not that you are dying, but that after death is the judgment and that you must stand before the judge of the, of the living and the dead to receive a sentence for the sins which you have committed in your body against him. That's the sting of death. The sting of death is you're going to go down into that grave, but you're not going into like some unconscious state of sleep. No, you are going literally to a burning hell. And the sting of death is not so much the torment that you're experiencing now, but that you are awaiting an actual judgment for a payment that is to come in the lake of fire. That is the sting of death. That is the victory of the grave, that that is what you will face. But for the believer, we can join with him in declaring, Spurgeon, I mean, in declaring this, I will not fear thee, death. Why should I? You look like a dragon, but your sting is gone. Your teeth are broken. And old, oh, old lion, wherefore should I fear you? I know thou art no more able to destroy me, but you are sent as a messenger to conduct me to the golden gate, wherein I shall enter and see my Savior, my Savior's unveiled face forever. Expiring saints have often said that their last beds have been the best they have ever slept upon. He is saying here, I don't have to fear death. I don't have any fear of death. Death has no power over me. Death has no victory. I don't even, I'm not afraid of it. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm longing for the day, not in some weird suicidal sense, but I know this, that when death comes for me, it's only there to translate me into his presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And to know this, that there's coming a day at the resurrection, the final battle, when death will be conquered. <laughs> And dying is going to die. Death is going to die. Are y'all with me? It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Death, in this sense, is an enemy. Death is an enemy of God. And there is coming a battle. There is coming a war. There is coming a day, hallelujah, where death will die. But to the believer, we appropriate this truth now. We live in this truth now. You can't kill a dead man. I already died. I died February 2nd, 2005 when I came to faith in Jesus and he made me alive in the newness of life, the life that I now live. I live by faith in the son of God. You can't kill me. Death is swallowed up in victory. I long for the day where I will see him face to face. This is the hope that I have, the future that I have. This is the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. We don't look upon death and grieve as those who have no hope. Death is sad. Death is evil. Death is not God's plan. When we see it, there should be a grievous thing that comes upon us, especially for the unbeliever. But we don't uh, get into this hopelessness or this state of paralysis. We're able, hallelujah, especially for the believer to say, I have tears, but my tears are not for your soul because you're in the presence of Jesus and how selfish it would be for me to long for you to not be in the presence of Jesus. My tears are for your physical presence but I will see you again, born again, believer, because death has been swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. Y'all, born again, believer, we have a hope. We have a future in Jesus. And this is foundational doctrine. This is just the ABCs. This is just elementary principles. Elementary principles. Why? Because it is intended that you build your life on these things. If you, if you lived your life building out 
your day to day with this in mind, how would you live? How would you live differently knowing that there's coming a resurrection of the dead? Knowing that for the just, you'll get a glorified body, but for the unjust, you're going to be, receive a body fit for damnation, fit for destruction. How would you live? How would you live if you had no fear of death? Not talking about in an ignorant sense that you're just out here like uh, uh, jumping out of airplanes every day or something, right? Like living reckless. No, but how would you live knowing that death can't stop you? That death doesn't hold you down. That death, hallelujah, is not something that you're looking fearful to because you know that the life that you're living right now is just to prepare you for the life that is to come. If you knew that death was going to be your crossover into the fullness of life where your life will just begin, would you not begin to practice for eternity? Would you not begin to prepare for eternity? If I'm going to spend my, my eternity beholding him, looking at him, worshiping him, glorifying him, magnifying him, would I not practice that now? Would I not prepare for that now? Hallelujah. This is why it's foundational. This is why it's beginner or entry principles that we build our life on. And as we build our life on these truths, we are able to go on to maturity, to grow up into him, into the fullness of the stature of the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. I hope this has made sense tonight. Uh, we're getting ready to pray here in just a moment. Uh, and then we will dismiss. Thank you again for all of you who have joined tonight. I really, really, really hope that this has blessed you. I hope that it has stirred you. I hope that uh, you will go on to study more, that you'll go on to read more. Again, tonight, I'm going to send you links to the, the full sermon, uh, both written and audio, so you can choose how you want to do that, uh, of the message by Charles Spurgeon on the resurrection of the dead. I'm also going to send you, uh, or not going to send you, I'm also encouraging you to uh, dive into 1 Corinthians 15 and really soak in that passage and allow that truth to speak to you uh, and, and you will be changed, all right? We only have one more session left, only one session left. Next week, Monday night, we are closing out our session uh, eight, which is on uh, the doctrine of eternal judgment. And that will wrap up the foundations, uh, foundational doctrines or foundational principles of Christ as outlined in Hebrews 6. Uh, verse one and two. I'm super excited, looking forward to that. Uh, so whether you're here live in per, uh, in person on the call tonight, or in class tonight, whether you're catching the replay or whether you're somebody who will see this far in the future, I hope that this has blessed you. I hope that you will follow through with this, go all through the sessions. If you missed any of the previous sessions, please, please do yourself a favor. Go back Watch each of those sessions. Uh, the book, Foundations, uh, will be ready. Let me see if I can share it with you real quick. Uh, let's see how we, I, I always forget how to do this. So let me see real quick. The book, Foundations, it was supposed to ship out at the end of March. So thank you guys so much for your patience. Uh, again, to those of you who are originally signed up, so the original registrants of this Monday night class, uh, uh, the Lord told me to do that at no charge. So you're getting this book and the only fee you have to pay for it is literally the cost to print and the cost to ship, which comes out to be uh, six fifty six dollars and fifty cents. Uh, so for those of you who originally signed up for the Monday night class, the book is available uh, for six dollars and fifty cents. You can get that book by going to carldwright.com slash foundations or you can cash at me at Carl D. Wright, $6.50. Make sure you send me your shipping address. Uh, the book should be ready literally probably in the next week or two. Just uh, got to order the prints and get that rolling. So we're working on that. Uh, but they will ship out here shortly. That book is going to be done. Inside that book is going to be a QR code for every person who gets a copy of that book where they will have access to every single one of these videos from the last or from uh, the foundations class. So all eight sessions uh, will be there for them. Eight, these sessions are about an hour and a half to two hours a piece. Eight times two is uh, uh, eight and eight is what, 16, right? So they have access to 16 hours of expounded teaching uh, on that book. So we're really excited. I'm going to ask all of you tonight, all of you who see this to pray with me, join me in prayer, because I'm not doing all of this uh, just because I have a desire uh, to do it, right? Doing all of this because the Lord burdened my heart for these truths. He burdened my heart for the church in this hour. And 
uh, showed me how his intention is to draw us back to Jesus through foundations that we might build, be built up a strong people, right? So my burden is that uh, that there be a people who not only, you know, shout, run, dance, speak in tongues, get excited, you know, move in the gifts, move in all this stuff, but that we are people who are solid on the foundations of our faith, that we're not just running around in arrested development, but that we uh, grow up into maturity, into all that God has purposed for us so that we can go beyond and actually grab a hold of and actualize all that God has purposed and promised for us as his children and as the church of Jesus. So pray with me that God would move on this uh, book, that God would move on these teachings, that many people will be saved heal, delivered, set free, that many people will be built up, that many people will be broken out of patterns and cycles of dysfunction, that many people will be broken out of that arrested development, and that we will see supernatural divine maturity on the born-again believer. That's what I'm believing to happen. Not only is there going to be that breaking off and people coming into maturity, but there is going to be a supernatural, uh, um, you're going to see, this is what I'm believing God for, a ton of testimonies of people who receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that receive baptism in water, who say, I never knew, I didn't know, but when I, when I studied, it clicked, and I have repented, I've gone on to be baptized in water, I've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I'm growing up into all things that God has promised me, that there are people who are breaking off generational curses, generational trauma, generational bondages by the truth of the word of God through Jesus. Are y'all with me? So y'all pray that with me. I'm going to pray us out, uh, out tonight, close out this session. Uh, thank you again for joining us. So pray with me. And I will see you again next week, Monday, 7 p.m. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we love you. Father, we bless you. Thank you that you are God. Lord, beside you, there is no other. Jesus, you alone are God. You are the mighty God. You are a powerful God. You are the God who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Father, tonight, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy towards us. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross and you got up from the grave to be our entry fee, to be the first fruits of all that is to come, that great harvest of the resurrection of the dead that we will enter into eternal life being able to declare that death is defeated, hallelujah, uh, that there is no sting of death anymore, that the grave is robbed of its victory. We have the victory. Death is swallowed up in it. Thank you, oh God, for the resurrection of the dead. Father, we pray tonight in the name of Jesus that you give us unction, unction of the Holy Ghost, that we will appropriate this truth, that we can live in, in resurrection power, anastasis, stand up power, resurrection power every single day day. Resurrection power in our heart. Resurrection power in our mind. Resurrection power in our families. Resurrection power with our spouses, with our children, uh, on our jobs, in our uh, day to day. Hallelujah. We're going to see the power of the resurrection that we are able to apply stand up power to every truth and every promise becoming partakers. Hallelujah. In that divine nature through the precious promises that you have given to us. Father, we thank you tonight that you continue to enlighten our eyes in the knowledge of you. And we bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Love you guys. Shout out to all of you again. Thank y'all for joining us tonight. We will see you next week, Monday. God bless you.